Hi, everyone, and welcome back. So this is our second lecture in the series for Intro to Data Analytics. And what we're going to focus on now really is the research process. So this comes from the Andy Field and Co. Uh, discovering Statistics Using R, which is where most of our lectures come from. And this can be used for either qualitative or quantitative data, like we were talking about at the end of the last lecture. So we've kind of got this like workflow chart thing here going here. So let's work through it. And the first thing is we might have some initial observation about the world. So something that needs explaining. What can we come up with that we would like to explain? Okay. And in other words, I'm going to formulate some sort of question that needs to be answered. Okay. So how can we um, improve resiliency after a natural disaster. Okay. Because one thing we know with the teams that I work with is that natural disasters are hard, right? And for people to show positive outcomes, they, something needs to happen, okay? So our, our research, our, this is a question that needs answering so that we can help people after things like a tornado or hurricane, flood, that kind of stuff. Okay. And that's the example I'll work through given this. So I can observe the real world. I know this is a problem that we, you know, hurricanes don't just stop. So we've got to come up with some sort of solution. Um, there's a lot of background research about resiliency and meaning making and, you know, positive psychological outcomes after trauma. And then lots of research on trauma. So I'm gonna read a bunch of that research. And I'm gonna ask others who research in this area what solutions they might have that we can test. So this is a question that needs to be answered. Okay. From there, we might test that concept. And so let's say that we are interested in this new idea of like everybody's attached to their phones, right? So is there some way that we can provide some like texting support that will allow people to refocus from the negative event, the uh, disaster, to more meaning-making events that might provoke, promote positive outcomes? So I could collect data on that and see if my hunch is correct. But to do that, I've got to take those words that I just said and somehow convert those into testable um, pieces. So we're going to walk through what those testable pieces are. Okay. And usually that involves defining some variables. So this is called um, op, you know, making an observational variable, something that we can actually define. So what do I mean by positive life outcomes? Right. I've kind of told you what I meant by natural disaster, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, that kind of stuff, pandemics. Um, but what can I do to define those other variables so that my hypothesis now becomes testable? So first thing we might have is some sort of theory. So, you know, clinical psychology, they've got a lot of theories, but what is a theory? So it's a, a set of rules or set of principles that explains the things that we've already seen and then allows us to generate new hypotheses. So we have some theories about how people are resilient and people you know, who um, focus on the positives should have better life outcomes. And this is a way oversimplification of my friend's research. But that's the basic idea. Okay. And so from that theory, I can generate a hypothesis. Well, if we can turn focus away from the negative event to the positive event, we should promote positive outcomes. And so theories are these sort of broad set of rules that allow us to come up with new things to test. From there, the new thing to test is the hypothesis part. So my hypothesis is some sort of prediction from the theory. So I hypothesize the people who we give this new refocusing texting therapy to should um, show better outcomes than the people who we don't give it to. So we have a sort of control group who doesn't get this um, new experimental therapy thing. Okay. And that prediction is that they're somehow different. Okay. I can predict that they get better, but life doesn't always work that way. So I could hedge my bets and say somehow these two groups will be different. Okay. And we'll talk about that a lot more in the next couple lectures. But a hypothesis should be clear and understandable. Right? So I hypothesize that these two groups are different because of my implementation of this texting telehealth. They should be testable. Okay, so is this testable? Could I actually do this on people? Yes. Okay. And this should be measurable. So I should be able to define numbers that go with each of these 
different components of the analysis. So I, you know, I should be able to define what I mean by positive psychological outcomes, and I should be able to categorize um, the different groups of people. Now, another key component of hypotheses is that they need to be falsifiable. And this gets a bit trickier. So I've got a great quote here from Karl, Karl Popper, who spoke extensively about this idea. And falsifiable means that they can be dis proven. Now we as science people don't love the word proof, so they can be unsupported. They can support something else. This hypothesis is not circular. Okay, so let me give you a good example. In clinical psych uh, clinical and cognitive psychology, for a long time there's this idea that people remembered things better because of their levels of encoding. Okay. So we have shallow encoding, you're not paying a whole lot of attention, you're just kind of passively taking it in a deep encoding where you're paying attention and connecting it to other new things in memory. And so you're gonna remember it better. Now the hypothesis is if you use deep encoding, you should remember it better. The problem with that is that the definition of remembering it of, of deep encoding was that you remembered it better. So the uh, idea became circular. So how do I know that they remembered it better? Well, it's deep encoding. Well, what's deep encoding defined as remembering it better? And so you just ended up with a circular logic where you could never sort of disprove this idea. Because if they didn't remember it, it was shallow encoding. But if you got differences between groups, you couldn't really say. Okay. So I want to make sure that these things are not circular, they're falsifiable. Okay. And in my study, I could um, find a new version of, th of therapy that works better. So that would disprove my, disprove. Um, change my support for this idea that my texting is the reason that it worked. Now within that, I have to identify some variables. And so most studies that we're gonna cover in this course are kind of um, your traditional studies where they have some sort of predictor variable, the independent variable, right? This is gonna be a proposed cause. Now, not all studies are causal in nature, meaning that they can be used to support cause and effect but they at least have usually generally, this is the reason something happened, okay? These are often called our predictor variables. And if I have a true experiment, okay, it's gonna be manipulated. Okay, and we'll get to that in piece in just uh, 10 or 20 slides, but true experiments are ones where the independent variable has been manipulated between groups. Okay. In our study, that's true. We have some of them, the tax therapy and some of them the not. And now in other studies, it's not ethical. Like I can't force some people to smoke and see if they get cancer. And then in other studies, it's just not possible at all. Like I can't suddenly make myself male, right? I just have to deal with the fact that um, if I'm gonna use some variables, uh, they just are. Right? We'll use that independent variable, see if it's gonna change this dependent variable. So it's our proposed effect. Okay? It's usually sometimes called the outcome or the criterion variable, and it's measured, not manipulated. So I've got my independent variable, it's my texting, which I think will affect my psychological outcomes. Okay, so got my IV and DV uh, defined. Now I have to start to give those variables levels of measurement. Okay. And the reason that this is important is because it often leads you down the path of which statistical analysis to pick. Okay, sometimes this is called the cookbook approach, where if you can define what the level of measurement is for the IV and the DV, you know what statistic is appropriate. Now, you can run the wrong statistic. <laughs> it's easy to do, especially with coding, but you know which one is the appropriate one to answer your question. And so in our case, this is a simple experiment, so it's a t-test. Okay, it's a usually a between subjects t-test, which we'll get to in the next video. Okay, not the t-test, but the, the idea of what is between subjects. So let's talk about the level of measurement. This is important. This is on the variables themselves, not on the experimental design. So we're making a distinction here between the variables and the design of the study. And both are important for understanding which statistic to pick. So before I do that, I have to even say, what, what, what is data in this type of experiment? Okay, so data is just a set of information, values, or measurements that can be quantitative or qualitative. Okay. And so data in some cases is measured, like our psychological outcomes, and some cases it's assigned. So we give people a group. Okay. 
And so that's that information in this sort of raw or unstructured form. Half of what we're going to do is talking about making sure this is clean and properly formatted. Um, that'll be in a couple of weeks. And it can consist of facts, figures, characters, symbols, numbers. Right? And so a lot of a lot of work that goes into dealing with data is, is getting it in the right format. Right? So in the R lecture, we talked a lot about the different formats and we might have to convert between them. So let's get into the types of measurements. So with our, our study, we have an IV and a DV, so they each kind of have their own level of measurement. And I often feel like this distinction between categorical and continuous is a bit false in the sense that um, this really tends to separate the types of statistics that you're going to do. And so this class is mostly a parametric statistics course that focuses on dealing with continuous variables. But really what, what's happening is the, the, the data under uh, the data itself has a range of possible levels of precision. And so we have data that is that is not very information carrying, where it has sort of only a couple of values, to data that ranges to what is called ratio data that has a lot of levels of precision and contains a lot more information. Okay. Some variables can only be measured at the low end. Some variables can be measured all the way across. And so what we're really gonna I really want to highlight here is that yes, we're gonna call these categorical and these continuous. But that distinction is not so black and white. So let's look at categorical variables first. These are things that we can divide into distinct categories. They usually have labels. So in my study of the texting group versus the not texting group, that's a distinct category. So that variable is technically binary, meaning it has two options. They're either in the experimental group or they're in the control group. But there's also nominal variables and ordinal variables. So let's do all three. Okay. Now a distinct point here when, it, when we kind of tie this back to the coding is that we often want these to be stored as a factor. Okay, Factor variables just force us into several options or character variable. Okay. Now the data might come in as a character variable and then you convert it into a factor because certain functions like factors better like ggplot. And then a lot of times data cleaning is dealing with the fact that these character variables aren't always what you expect them to be. So if you ever have a study where you let people type things in, you're going to find out real quick that people can't spell, <laughs> myself included, and um, that you'll spend a lot of time forcing them into the right spelling. You'd be amazed at the number of different ways people spell um, male and female. Okay, And so a factor variable specifically in R is something that is forced into these distinct categories. Character variables, it can be whatever, but factor variables, we're going to force them to be like this or that. Okay. So let's look at uh, binary variables first. These are things that are only two categories, dead or alive from the book, okay, or on or off. Okay. So things are this or that, experimental group or the control group. A nominal variable, on the other hand, has more than two categories. Okay? And that distinction it seems kind of silly to, to talk about, but that distinction determines if you're going to do things like a t-test or if you're going to do things like an ANOVA. So it's important to know that, you know, one, you know, kind of allows you a different path. Okay? We get more into that distinction later in the semester, but there is a reason to have both of these. Okay? And so I might say someone is assistant, associate, or full professor. Okay, those are different levels, different categories that a um, professor could be. Okay. Hi, Pop-Up. Are you going to join us? She's giving me a look here. <laughs> it's dinner time. Oh, oh, you almost can see her. I said my stats background is hiding the dog. <laughs> so you'll get to hear the little dog clipping around. But let's talk about ordinal variables. Okay, she's so excited. An ordinal variable is a nominal variable that has an order. So it's kind of hidden in the name here, ordinal. And so technically, assist, hey, no ma'am. Technically, assistant, associate, and full professor has an order because you progress through those. Okay. One is lower rank than the other. But let's say we force our exams into pass, fail, or gold star. Okay, those have an order. And there was a natural underlying, like kind of continuous con um, continuum there. 
like a, a score, research score, and we forced it into these categories. And so this is what happens when you get grades at the end of the semester. There was a number under there, a nice continuous number, but we forced it in these categories. So for graduate classes, there's F, there's C, B, and A. And so we've made that variable ordinal, but it has a rank to it. Okay, sometimes these are called rank variables. And so let's say we also classify economic status. This is low, medium, and high, but we do this a lot. We have like a poverty level, low income, you know, upper middle class. Like we have these labels for them that aren't super descriptive. So their level of precision is not that great. Okay. We could also think about this as things that are first, second, third. So I love to talk about Michael Phelps because sometimes he wins by these much. Sometimes he wins by this much when he was racing, right? And so, but there's still, he's still winning first. So if you, if you win by this much, you're still in first, then the, this much. And that's the real difference between the divide here between categorical and continuous variables. If it doesn't have the, the specificity of the distance between them, it's gonna be considered categorical. If it does have that difference, it's considered continuous. So uh, this definition is not that great, but every entity gets a distinct score and these scores are relatable to each other. And there's two different ways, interval level measurement and a ratio level measurement. Okay. So an interval level measurement is something where there are equal intervals on the variable. Okay. So with first to second, that distance is not the same necessarily from second to third. So this is um, uh, this idea of interval level measurement is that six to eight is two points, 13, 15 is two points. And so that's what makes it different than an ordinal variable. Okay. So first, second, third does not have this separation difference. Okay. I also briefly wanna talk about Likert type variables. Okay. These are your strongly disagree to strongly agree variables. We give those numbers, one, two, three, four, five. But the distance between one to two, strongly disagree to somewhat disagree, is that the same distance as four to five, somewhat agree to strongly agree? If you've ever done a teaching evaluation, you know it's probably not. <laughs> so there's an argument over, should we treat those as ordinal or should we treat them as interval? Okay, we'll get more into that as we go. So there's a, a food for thought question. Okay. Now, the other distinction here is that interval variables do not have a true, what's called a true zero. Okay. A true zero means an absence of something. And so temperature is this really great example where it has these distinct ratios and which we'll get to in a second. And these, these separations, these intervals, but doesn't have a true zero. And it doesn't matter if you're using Celsius or Fahrenheit, zero is really cold. Okay, it doesn't mean no temperature. So, um, you know, that would be considered an interval level measurement. Okay. So ratio data includes all the information from interval, but the ratios on the score of the scale also must make sense. Okay, so something that is a two is, um, I'm sorry, something that is a four is twice as much as the two. Okay. Now, a lot of times interval scales kind of have that, but they also have to have true zeros. Now, this doesn't mean that the scale can literally have a zero because height is technically a ratio scale. I mean, you wouldn't say something has a zero height, but theoretically things could have an absence of height. It's kind of a weird concept, but you can have an absence of temperature, but you can have an absence of height or absence of weight, especially when we talk about changes, okay? So a score of 16 is, is twice as much as eight. Okay. If you don't have that, it's an interval scale. Now, Let's end here on this idea of measurement error. Okay. So with all of our scales, we're likely to have this, to have some form of error, okay? And so accuracy is just really cool. So we have to, we have to think about bias, like what, what's in the data and also just how, how we're measuring our variables. So it seems like if I give people and I measure them somehow that it must be accurate, but here's an example. And sometimes it's called observational error. And it's the discrepancy between the actual value we're trying to measure and the number that we end up with on that scale. Okay. So in reality, let's say I weigh 80 kilograms because I have no idea what that means in pounds. So this won't sound good to have a British example. 
I stand on my bathroom scale and it tells me 83. So I'm disappointed. Okay. But the measurement error here would be three kilograms. Okay. Now, maybe I know this by grabbing a more accurate measure, but then we run into the problem of, of, of scales like IQ. Okay, which one is the most accurate? Okay, are they even worth their salt? Are they even accurate at all? And so we kind of have to deal with these with these measurement issues by thinking about what's the gold standard and do we have a way to perfect our measurement? Okay. So for my coming back to my res, um, positive outcomes measure, uh, there are things like the post-traumatic post growth scale. Uh, I could think about meaning as a positive life outcome. There are a bunch of scales for those. And so I, I kind of have to pick which one is the best. Okay. And then some versions of error are things that I can't control. And we'll get to those in the next lecture. So we're going to pause here to make these not super long. And we'll catch you in the third part of our series for data, intro to data analytics.